Each of us knows how to work quietly. That's very important. Will you show us? Of course. Boys and girls, how would you like to show some of the ways we know of being quiet? Yeah! Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. In the next five to ten minutes, we're going to take the election of 1988 and we're going to chop, 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 chop it up for you to grow your brain. Um, this lecture is good if you're an AP government student, maybe if you're in an intro to political science class, or you just want to grow your brain. Um, let's really kind of look at context first. In 1988, the election of 1988, which of course occurs in 1987, um, we see a couple things in terms of like Reagan being really popular at the end of his second term. And I think some of that popularity is definitely going to rub off on his vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush, who's inheriting kind of like a pretty good economy. Uh, Cold War is kind of ending, so it's looking pretty good for Reagan and the country. And generally, when things are going well, the country doesn't change parties. So I think that's a big idea. Um, other stuff in terms of context, the Democrats are a little bit excited because they want control of the Senate in 86 because of Iran-Contra. Um, so I think both parties see reason for winning. But at the end of the day, incumbency is really, really strong. And like I said, I think it's going to rub off on George Bush. Um, George Robert Walker Bush beat Bob Dole, uh, Robert Dole from Kansas, for the nomination and chose Dan Quayle, the Indiana senator, for his vice president. Maybe one of the few choices that he might have regretted. And if we take a look at Dan Quayle in 1987, I think he was 11, maybe he was 12. But he definitely didn't look like he was old enough to be vice president and then president. And I think that, that, that people question that decision. And I think he did it for various reasons, maybe to win Indiana, uh, maybe to uh, try changing the, the, the Republican Party. But nevertheless, they're going to be the nominees. Um, at the convention, uh, George Bush delivers a very famous line, read my lips, no new taxes. The party is drifting more towards kind of no taxes under any circumstance. Today, that's kind of hyperized a million times. But uh, Bush, I think, is a compassionate, conservative moderate. I don't think he's like Republicans that far to the right maybe today. He's not a Tea Party guy, that's for sure. Uh, you know, he was originally from the Northeast, Connecticut, so he's not like an Ivy League guy. Had a house in Massachusetts uh, in, in Maine, and then a lot of his kids moved away, like Bush went to Texas. And, but they're definitely New Englanders, and he's going to win Maine, and I think he won Connecticut. Um, but, you know, I remember his thousand points of light, kind of volunteerism, a thousand points of light being the hope for America, not big government. Um, but let's put those guys to the side, right? On the other side, we have a very interesting story. Um, the Democrats don't want a repeat of 1984. Um, in 1984, a sweep, it's a sweep, Walter Mondale got blown out, like blown out. So we don't. The, the, the Democratic Party, maybe the base does, wants to avoid going too far to the left. They want like a new Democrat. Um, eventually in 92, that's going to be Bill Clinton that, that does it. But in 1988, it was Gary Hart, 87. Um, Gary Hart, Colorado senator, I believe, um, was the, w w did really well in 84. So he's kind of like expected to win. And then a lot of people thought that he would be a very serious contender. Because if you're a new Democrat, if you're moving to the middle, you have a chance to capture maybe that suburban vote that that Reagan Democrat, that guy that was a Democrat that left the party for whatever reason, social order reasons, that Gary Hart could appeal to. Um, Gary Hart also appealed to the ladies. Yeah, that's why he didn't become president. Donna Rice was his downfall. And really, that's the beginning, I think, of like sex scandals and the news and the National Enquirer and like the dress and Monica. And, oh, my God. All that stuff really first affected Gary Hart. So once Gary Hart drops out of the race, it's like a like WrestleMania, man. There's like 50 people running. Maybe not 50. Joe Biden, Al Gore, Paul Simon, uh, Gephardt, Jackson. I think Cuomo was almost in there for a little while. Clinton almost ran. I'm probably forgetting somebody, but um, the guy who won, that's who I forgot. Eventually, after they split all these states, it ends up being Michael Dukakis, the liberal governor of Massachusetts. And he said he was a proud liberal. And I think that's eventually going to play into the hands of the uh, Republicans. But he chose Lloyd Benson for uh, his vice president. Um, vice presidential choices aren't really, really important in the outcome, but you can usually figure out why they chose them. I think that Dukakis thought he was JFK. JFK is from Massachusetts. Dukakis is from Massachusetts. They both choose Texas senators with experience in the Senate. Lyndon Johnson and now Lloyd Benson. And I think that it was too strategic, to be honest with you. I think Lloyd Benson looked more presidential than Michael Dukakis, and I think it kind of backfired. 
Um, some of the less interesting things, but we probably should say um, a big moment at the vice presidential debate when Lloyd Benson did the smackdown of uh, little Dan Quayle, when Dan Quayle compared himself to JFK, and Benson was like, I knew JFK, you ain't JFK. Um, but at the end of the day, vice presidential debates, you know, write this down in your notebook, really aren't going to determine who's going to be president. And uh, Quayle would just like mutter out, attack Dukakis, he would just go after Dukakis, and I think most Americans didn't take that too seriously. Um, let's take a look at the uh, kind of the issues of the day and, and really what's going to be the campaign ads and the map. Let me just tie my shoe. Careful with your shoelaces. Um, I think at the end of the day, this is really um, a win for Bush because they were successful at the campaign in attacking and labeling Dukakis. You want to, you want to um, define yourself on your own terms, like who you are as a candidate. And I think that uh, Lee Atwater, who was the campaign manager, I believe, for Bush, was like an attack dog. He was like really good at destroying people. Um, there were some like underground campaign stuff that went on. Uh, Kitty Dukakis, uh, it was said that burned an American flag. They said that Dukakis was in a mental institution. And so even under the ground, dirty stuff is going to affect the election to a certain degree. Um, but the bigger ones are the big ads. And Dukakis, by laboring, labeling himself liberal, I think put himself in a box that uh, Republicans just kind of took sticks out and beat the box really bad. Like, liberals are generally um, for uh, uh, being against the death penalty. Maybe it's a civil rights issue for them, or um, an issue of unfairness, or an issue of cruel and unusual punishment. Um, but in 1987, the country is, is more for the death penalty. It's the kind of the crack epidemic, and there's lots of violence, and there's lots of serial murders in the news, and being against the death penalty is not swag. So when uh, Bernie Shaw from CNN asked Michael Dukakis what you would do if your wife was raped and murdered, um, Dukakis like went into liberal robot boy mode and gave a very technical answer about how, well, I'm against the death penalty for X and Y reasons. And people were like, whoa, no, no don't dog your wife like that. Um, and I think a more eloquent answer would have been one where he had really said, I would have liked to kill the guy. But nevertheless, he falls into that liberal trap, that liberal mode. Um, when he was governor of Massachusetts, there was a furlough program. A furlough program is where you give like weekend passes uh, for good behavior. It's like a motivation for prisoners to do the right thing. And uh, it was already started when Dukakis was there. So there's hundreds of you know, people that are getting left, let out on weekends. One of them was Willie Horton. And Willie Horton becomes like fodder for the Republicans to use. That face is going to scare the heck out of suburban voters. And there were claims of dog whistle politics. Like dog whistle politics is when the other side isn't outwardly racist, but kind of like under the water racism, where only certain people kind of it appeals to emotion or to underground racism or people that don't want to say they're racist. Um, and... I think that won the campaign for Bush. It might have. The other one was when Dukakis went to uh, show how hardcore he was. So he went and he climbed into a tank. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, this doesn't look good. And uh, I think that people, like, laughed at Dukakis. They couldn't see him in that kind of commander-in-chief role. Um, let's take a look, I think, now, really, at um, kind of the electoral map. You know, we could say other stuff. ACLU, a, a liberal organization that Dukakis belonged to, probably didn't um, help him very much. Uh, he was against, I think, making kids say the Pledge of Allegiance. So, you know, if you can put someone in that liberal box by taking their positions that don't appeal to the mainstream and exploiting them, that's what politics is all about. So, let's take a look at the electoral map. It is a electoral blowout of 426 to 111. Uh, popular vote, which doesn't mirror the electoral vote very closely sometimes, is like a 53-46% split. But let's just look at de-alignment and realignment, and we can see if we can wrap this up for you guys. Um, in terms of like the Deep South, and remember Florida is not really a southern state when we talk about electoral politics. Um, it's actually opposite. Like I think that northern Florida is like the south. And southern Florida is like the north for demographic reasons. So that state's always kind of in play. But definitely all of these states that are like the Jim Crow states, the deep south states, the confederate states, are not going to vote for the Massachusetts liberal. Um, so that's kind of like been like realigned already. All of those white voters that were once New Deal voters are now Reagan Republicans and soon they're going to be Tea Party Republicans forever and ever. The Northeast, which if we go back 50 or 60 years, is reliable Republican. 
um, and then changed in the New Deal is, is kind of like trying to stay blue. You can see New York is blue. Five percentage points, four percentage points to cop this one. Um, but it's only going to get bluer from here. Um, when states like Maine and some of these more libertarian states are still red, they're going for that northeastern Bush Republicanism. Um, in terms of West Virginia, I can't believe West Virginia is blue, but it stays for maybe economic reasons in, in the Democratic camp. You know, even though Reagan's numbers are looking pretty good, there's a really high deficit, um, stagnant wages for the lower middle class, the rich are in a sense getting richer, and poor people are maybe not getting ahead as much, so there might be some kind of anger with unions and miners and blue collar workers that are going to uh, have them vote Democratic. Um, California is red. I think it's the last time it'll ever be red because it is uh, really shifting to the Democrats in the next elections. So um, I think that that's probably good, man. If you know that Bush won, uh, that he was Reagan's vice president, that he, he was kind of that compassionate conservative that had people run a very dirty, mean race at Dukakis and labeled him a liberal, then you probably can get through a couple paragraphs. We're going to do a shout out for the Paul box. Ron Paul is the Libertarian nominee that year. Um, didn't do tremendously well, but that Libertarian uh, kind of idea is always in the background of American politics, and I believe it's uh, probably getting louder now. So I think that's all, guys. We're going to chop, 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 and see you later. We'll see you in 1992 for some clips, too. Every adult agrees on one basic goal for all students. Schools ought to turn out good citizens. Yes, good citizens. That's right. Absolutely, this country always needs good citizens.